Hello and welcome to the LLG Grapevine podcast. You're listening to Helen McGrath, Head of Public Affairs, and Dennis Hall, LLG Bulletin Editor. Hi, everyone. Well, we're back after a long, hot summer, during which the team has been scattered far and wide at their various holiday destinations, with Ireland and Scotland featuring heavily. Meanwhile, the news agenda has been utterly overwhelmed by the emerging unprecedented cost of living crisis which will affect all our communities severely for the foreseeable future. So, Dennis, uh, I'm delighted to be back once again with you on this podcast, and I know you've been looking very closely at what our sector is putting together to support councils during this crisis. What have you got for us? Yes, Helen, and welcome back too. Looking forward to this. I begin this grapevine, the first after our summer break, with two items that direct attention to the resources available to support our members in advising their councils at this most difficult time. In the second of these items, I have commentary on the role that scrutiny has to play in the process of developing effective policies. So, here's my first item. The rising costs of fuel, food and other essentials are combining with existing disadvantage and vulnerability within our communities to put many households at greater risk of both immediate hardship and reduced opportunity and well-being. These are unprecedented circumstances. To advise properly, you need to be informed effectively and fully, and the new LGA Cost of Living Crisis Hub has been designed to share best practice and help councils to support their residents with the rise in the cost of living. Councils and local partners have delivered remarkable services and support and will continue to do what they can to protect people against higher costs, targeting help at those facing the most complex challenges. But they can't tackle these problems alone. And the LGA says that we need to strengthen and maintain a collaborative approach between national and local government and key partners in the private, public and voluntary sector. The LGA are calling for three key things to happen. First, the setting up of a fair, accessible and sufficient mainstream benefit system, providing financial stability for those most vulnerable to the impact of the crisis. Second, for councils and local partners to have adequate, sustainable resources to provide targeted and effective crisis support. And third, for councils to be given the freedom and flexibility to lead local approaches which build strong local economies in the longer term. Now, the new LGA hub contains case studies, resources and data to share best practice in this area, covering topics including food insecurity, fuel poverty, health, well-being and employment. There's a newsletter facility available to access as well. Responding to this crisis will involve the familiar strategic challenges, corporate policy making, asset management decisions, service and budgetary pressures, and priority assessment in the allocation and use of resources. As lawyers, your role will be central in each of these decisions. Over the coming months, LLG will be tracking the full implications of the cost of living crisis for our sector, so watch out for more on this. We certainly will, Dennis. Now, in other news, the situation in Ukraine is of course still very concerning as two are the numbers of people from Ukraine seeking homelessness assistance. The government has now started publishing information on homelessness duties accepted by local authorities in England in respect of Ukrainian households. The latest figures show that councils are still facing the most significant number of homelessness presentations through the family visa scheme, uh, almost 70% of the total number. The LGA reports that large numbers of arrivals are still coming via the Family Visa Scheme rather than the Homes for Ukraine Scheme. Councils, of course, are keen to find a sponsorship route to support them if their accommodation and support breaks down to avoid families and individuals needing to present as homeless. The funding and data says the LGA needs to flow to councils to enable this. Now, I took a look at the numbers myself, which currently runs the end of July, and I can see that there's been 1,335 approaches made to local authorities since February, with the vast majority, unsurprisingly, occurring in the London boroughs. Hounslow, Hillingdon and Richmond-upon-Thames saw the most, with Manchester featuring the highest outside of London. The LGA are concerned that the £10,500 allocated 
for councils is only for the Homes for Ukraine scheme. And they're arguing that councils should be resourced to support all those who arrive from Ukraine since the start of the war, regardless of the route used to enter the country, as they still need and want to utilise local services to meet their specific support needs as new arrivals to the UK. And this, of course, incurs costs to councils and their local partners. Now, returning to the cost of living crisis, Dennis, what role might scrutiny play in helping councils make decisions in this challenging situation? Helen, the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny have made some initial suggestions on how scrutiny ought to be engaged during the crisis. So here's more on this. I recommend that you take a look at Megan Ingle's commentary on the role of scrutiny during the cost of living crisis. It's on the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny website. Megan recognises that councils have very limited resources to deal with this escalating crisis, especially as many councils will still be recovering financially from the COVID pandemic and more generally the lack of government funding. As government support remains totally inadequate, councils will be expected to bear the brunt of the crisis on the front line. Significantly, no support is being directed to councils for them to deal with the staggering rise in fuel costs, and we are yet to see what impact this will have upon the availability and use of public buildings. It's in this context that councils now need to predict what the worst of the impact will be and how they can protect households from rising costs, especially targeting assistance to those who are most vulnerable. The cross-cutting nature of the crisis will inevitably make it difficult for councils to fully predict what policy responses and support packages may look like. Scrutiny committees can play an integral part during this ongoing crisis. Importantly, they are led by elected councillors who will have live experience and an understanding of the real and immediate needs of their communities. It is this aspect that makes scrutiny so important to, to policy decision making. Scrutiny processes can use this first-hand knowledge to help to develop effective policy, bringing to bear a wider range of perspectives and experiences and perhaps more than where Cabinet acts alone. Megan says that the scrutiny function needs to understand and support the Council and its partners as they engage with this situation, providing assistance in understanding complex problems. In order to do this, scrutiny members will require regular access to information about services and community need so that they can escalate matters of particular concern. Scrutiny provides an excellent opportunity to discuss at a council-wide level the concerns and challenges local people are talking about at council member surgeries. In terms of work programmes, at this stage in the year, most council scrutiny work programmes will already have been planned and in place well in advance. As ever, good work programmes have built-in flexibility and it may be necessary to look again at the work programme and carefully reprioritize to take account of the current crisis. And this may well involve removing and adding items as necessary, putting items on hold to make way for matters of immediate concern. Scrutiny committees may take more cross-partnership approaches to ensure that all those with a stake in supporting local people are brought into the bigger conversation. It may be that issues also cut across geographical boundaries, in which case it may be fruitful to engage with other authorities and explore examples of best practice elsewhere. So take a look, a close look at this article and review your scrutiny schedule accordingly. It is essential that your council's response to this crisis does make a difference and make a difference right now. Interesting, Dennis, especially around the cross partnership approach. We'll be welcoming Ed Hammond from the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny to the podcast in October and can ask him more on his thoughts in this area. Now, the SRA have published analysis of the SQE assessment results undertaken in two parts in November last year and April of this year. Brief headlines from the SQE1 assessments. Pass rates amongst male and females were identical at 54%. Pass rates amongst candidates who declared a disability compared with those who didn't were also very similar with 55 passing with a disability declared and 53% without. 
The SRA state that they are keen to monitor whether factors such as social economic status affect performance on the SQE. They state that the first assessment suggested that there was no significant difference in results based on socioeconomic background. For example, there was no significant difference between the performance of candidates who declared they went to non-selective state schools at 57% and those who went to a private school without a bursary at 54%. And indeed, between those who were from a working class background at 54% compared to those with a parent or guardian from a professional background at 56%. However, factors such as achieving a top grade at university or prior work experience were indicators of a greater likelihood to pass. Although numbers were small, pass rates by solicitor apprentice candidates were well above average, which is good to hear. However, white candidates generally performed better than candidates from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And I know the Law Society produced much commentary on this issue about the need to address inequalities throughout the summer. The SQE2 assessments, which included oral assessments, generally had a higher pass rate at 70% or above. Of real interest here is that 92% of candidates who declared a disability passed overall compared to 77% of those who said they did not. Concerningly again, however, white candidates generally perform better than candidates from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And in this regard, the SRA has stated, and I quote, we are committed to exploring the reasons for this long-standing pattern of differential attainment, and we have appointed the University of Exeter to conduct research into this important area. We will keep a track on that research and report again. Changing the subject entirely, your final item today, Dennis, is about procurement strategy. Tell us more. Yes, the LGA have announced changes to their national procurement strategy for councils. Here's the story. The LGA has published a timely refresh of its national procurement strategy for local government in England. This is launched at a time of many opportunities and many pressures on council procurement. Councils are tasked with delivering not just economic and social value to our communities, but also achieving the government's levelling up agenda. So, what messages are the LGA putting across as part of this announcement? They say that the role of procurement in local government remains pivotal in maximising these opportunities through existing supply chains and managing the challenges faced by our sector and our communities. The LGA point out that third party spending is increasing, as is the reliance on procured goods and services, with local government remaining a significant commissioner and purchaser across all key spend categories. The current operating environment sees both increased and extraordinary pressures on councils facing further restrictions on both revenue and capital finances. In addition, Increased volume and complexity of demand and market pressures on services, particularly social care, creates further challenges for councils. And there are other factors too. Increased costs due to high inflation, higher energy costs, the climate change emergency, disruptions in supply chains, and suppliers unable to meet contractual commitments. And of course, the war in Ukraine. These are all material to the way in which councils approach procurement. There is an immediate imperative for the sector to share new approaches and to learn both rapidly and openly with key partners, including commercial partners. The LGA said that we need to continue the improvement journey supported by a clear strategy. And that is what this announcement is all about. The revised procurement strategy is accompanied by a useful toolkit that analyzes the key stages of the application of the strategy and will be of key interest to all commercial lawyers and procurement practitioners. Thank you, Dennis. Now, just to flag a couple of things, there's currently a 15% reduction in one day training courses running throughout September and October for our members. And we're also taking a lot of bookings for our LLG governance conference in November. So please make sure you get yours in. LRG are currently recruiting for three national leads in the areas of childcare, housing and information governance. If you're interested, please do contact me for an informal chat to understand what's required and what you can get out of it. 
quite a lot as it happens. And on that note, that's it for another edition of the podcast. You can read more on the items discussed today and many more besides by going to bulletin number 32, available on the LLG website now. So it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me too. Thank you for listening. Have a good week, everybody.